today's uh, cross-program speaker. So Scott Aronson is, a, in fact, an old friend of PCMI. He's been here before. And uh, I think he's somebody who almost needs no introduction. You know, he's a great luminary in the world of quantum computation, AI, and a number of other things. And we're very pleased to have him give a talk about verifiable quantum supremacy. Can you hear now? All right, can you hear? All right, um, so uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, let's see, so uh, uh, I am uh, currently uh, uh, on leave from quantum computing for a couple of years. Uh, I'm working at OpenAI uh, on uh, how to stop the robot apocalypse, uh, which I haven't, I haven't figured out how to do that. Um, uh, I did ask uh, Dolly, uh, uh, to uh, 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 for for its insights about verifiable quantum supremacy, and it came up with this image here. I'm not sure if there's any insight there or not, uh, but uh, um, uh, basically, uh, what I want to do in this talk is uh, tell you about you know quantum supremacy or or advantage experiments, uh, what's been accomplished uh, over the past uh, four or five years, and. Uh, uh, you know, and, and in particular with, you know, demonstrating the possibility of a, a, a real quantum speed up on a, a NISC, uh, you know, noisy intermediate scale uh, quantum device, uh, one that is not a uh, full error corrected quantum computer uh, like we uh, heard about in the last talk. Um, um, and, and then I want to tell you what are the shortcomings of these experiments, uh, why are we not satisfied with them, and, uh, and what remains to be done, uh, what, I, what, I, what I hope uh, uh, will, will happen next. And if I'm you know, too busy uh, trying to stop the, uh, the robot apocalypse, then I hope that you know, the truly important problems like, like these uh, of uh, designing uh, better uh, sampling-based quantum supremacy experiments uh, can be taken up by, uh, by, by, by one of you. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm offering uh, a, a research program, uh, you know, free of charge for anyone who would like it, basically. Uh, so I, I don't actually have many slides, so, so feel free to interrupt me uh, if uh, anything is not clear. I mean, I know that this is a uh, diverse audience in terms of people's backgrounds, so uh, feel free to interject. Okay, so... Um, uh, uh, you know, you've all heard something, uh, uh, presumably, about, about, you know, quantum supremacy experiments, uh, which uh, uh, a, a lot of people have switched to calling them quantum advantage experiments uh, for, for various reasons. I might, I might I'm, uh, 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 use the two terms interchangeably. Uh, but um, uh, uh, so, so uh, uh, you know, what, what is the idea here? Uh, so, you know, since the you know, 1990s, we have known uh, that uh, of, of uh, certain quantum algorithms, such as uh, Shor's factoring algorithm, uh, that, you know, seem to get exponential speed ups, you know, at least uh, compared to any currently known classical algorithm, okay, for certain very specific problems, you know, in the case of Shor's algorithm, factoring integers uh, and uh, taking discrete logs. Um, uh, but, but, uh, 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 these algorithms generally uh, seem to require a fault-tolerant quantum computer, uh, uh, so one that is uh, constantly uh, doing error correction to uh, 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 cope with you know, the unwanted interaction between the quantum computer and its environment. Um, and uh, you know, to do error correction uh, by any known method uh, seems to require uh, hundreds or, or thousands of physical qubits uh, for every logical qubit that you are trying to simulate. Okay, so if you wanted to run Shor's algorithm, let's say to factor RSA 2048, you know, uh, beyond what, you know, uh, 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 the current classical supercomputers could, could do in, in a reasonable time uh, with any currently known algorithm, uh, then uh, it seems like you know you would need thousands of logical qubits, which then translates into millions or hundreds of millions of physical qubits. 
Okay, and you know maybe someday that will happen. Uh, you know, I uh, you know maybe you know there will be a, a Manhattan project to build that. You know, I understand that uh, uh, there was a PCMI showing of Oppenheimer last week. Um, you know, it'll, it'll 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 be a lot harder to keep secret this time. I think. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, you know if if you if you try to do the Manhattan Project today, within about 15 minutes, like what is happening in Los Alamos would be trending on Twitter. Uh, but um, hmm? uh, oh, uh, excuse me, on X, yes. Uh, so. Uh, uh, but you know, okay, you know, with, with with enough effort, maybe you could build that. But that, but that is not where we are now, and so. Uh, uh so maybe you know, 12 or 13 years ago, uh, some of us uh, started as uh, asking the question: uh, uh, Well, you know, suppose you want to use a noisy device, you know, a, a, a non-error corrected, non-fault tolerant, uh, not you know, maybe not even universal device, but such as might be available, you know, within the next uh, decade or so, uh, and your goal was to do something. Uh, some well-defined task uh, much faster than any known classical method could do that task. Now notice that I did not say a useful task. Okay, that's not part of what we're aiming for here. Okay, we're you know there and and you know I, I feel like you know. Part of the problem when there is all this press about quantum computers, you know, speeding up fin uh, finance and you know uh, vehicle routing and industrial optimization. I mean, it really gives people the impression that you know, yeah, quantum speed up is a done deal, and we just have to now we just have to uh, uh, get all the commercial value out of it. When actually the core scientific question, just can we beat a classical computer in a fair comparison for anything at all? You know, even that is still, you know, uh, I think still not experimentally demonstrated, you know, or not, not, not clearly enough. And that, and, 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 and that, that is still true even today. Um, you know, uh, but at least on that scientific goal, we've managed to make some progress. Okay, so, so how was that done? So, uh, you know, if, if, if your only goal is to uh, um, do something faster, with a quantum computer, and you don't care about whether it's useful, uh, it turns out that a, a key thing that you typically want to do is to switch attention from uh, um, you know, problems with a single right answer, like factoring, uh, to sampling problems. Okay, a sampling problem is one where the desired output is a sample from a certain probability distribution. Okay, so uh, you know the the you know even if if your quantum computer is running perfectly, it might never produce you know the same output twice uh, with it with uh, in in its whole lifetime, right? It'll generate a different output every time, and uh, and now verifying uh, uh, you know whether you know the quantum computer is working correctly. Well, that'll be a key question, but uh, it'll be something statistical that that will that will need to do. To say like, are these a reasonable set of outputs uh, uh, that have been generated? Uh, so you know, actually, there was a very, uh, uh, I think, prescient uh, early work in that direction by uh, Tarhal and De Vincenzo in 2004 uh, on constant depth quantum circuits. Uh, Barbara Tarhal is here, I think, uh, somewhere here. Uh, but. Uh, um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, around 2010 or so, uh, um, uh, I guess independently, uh, Bremner, Joza, and Shepard, uh, and uh, and me and Alex Arkhipov uh, started thinking about uh, you know different ways that you might achieve this with with near future uh, uh, quantum computers, and and what we both found was that you know there were at least two advantages uh, to switching your attention to these sampling problems. Uh, the first advantage is that um, uh, the, uh, uh, the problem that you're solving you know, can be sort of much, much closer to the native hardware, right? The, uh, the analogy that we used in our paper was uh, you know, if you, um, uh, uh, you know, wanted to prove uh, that a dolphin is smart, you know, you might be able to like laboriously teach it arithmetic. You know, teach it to simulate uh, some, uh, you know, or, you know, solving some puzzle. But actually, it would be much easier to just watch it in its habitat. You know, doing whatever dolphins do. 
right? And so, you know, likewise, rather than, you know, teaching a uh, quantum computer to do modular exponentiation, you know, maybe, you know, if we just want to see that it is hard to simulate with a classical computer, it will be easier to just apply a more or less random sequence of gates and uh, just sample from the resulting distribution and, you know, and then argue that a classical computer would have taken a long time to do the same thing. Okay, and you know that brings me to the second point, uh, which is that uh, uh, you know we were uh, able to give evidence, you know, at least that at least the exact versions of these sampling tasks uh, really are hard for classical computers. Okay, we could show that uh, if there were a fast classical algorithm that could sample from exactly the same distribution that the ideal quantum device uh, would sample from, then uh, the polynomial hierarchy would collapse to the third level. Now, if you don't know what that means, you could take my word for it that it's bad. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, if you know the, the P versus NP problem, it's sort of like P equaling NP, but just sort of at a higher level up where we you know, wouldn't quite notice it uh, here on Earth, but, uh, but in the heavens they would notice it. Okay, so, uh, um, you know, so that, that, you know, in the present state of complexity theory, that's you know, close to the strongest kind of evidence that we hope for, that, that anything is hard. Uh, and you know, in, in the so um, so what was uh, so 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 the proposal by me and Arkhipov uh, was called boson sampling, and uh, all we said to do is uh, generate a bunch of uh, single photons, uh, send them through a network of beam splitters and phase shifters, what are called linear optical elements, uh, and then measure where they end up. So have an array of photo detectors uh, that measure how many photons there are in each output port. Okay, and uh, you know since this is quantum mechanics, uh, uh, you know the answer you know you know will be a sample from a probability distribution. The photons could end up in a different place each time, but you know the task is just uh, you know precisely to simulate what the device does. Uh, and now the key fact that we uh, re relied on. Uh, it's actually something that I learned from uh, from Avi Wigderson uh, back in in 2000 when I was just starting as a grad student, uh, and he said, uh, uh, you know, it turns out that you know, like there are these two really central functions in computer science uh, uh, of matrices, the determinant and the permanent, and it turns out that if you have n I, I, and, and there are two very basic types of particles in the universe, fermions and bosons. Right? And it turns out that if you have n identical fermions and you want to know what is the amplitude for them to go from some I input state to some output state and they're not interacting, then you have to calculate the determinant of an n by n matrix. Okay, And if they're bosons, then you have to take the permanent of an n by n matrix. Okay, uh, and now uh, in computer science, we know that these two functions, I mean, they're, they're almost the same in their definition, right? They differ just be because the determinant has minus signs and the permanent does not. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but they differ dramatically in uh, computational complexity. The determinant is computable in polynomial time, for example, using Gaussian elimination. Uh, the permanent was famously proved by uh, Valiant in 1979 to be sharp P complete, which means sort of at least as hard as any combinatorial counting problem, like computing partition functions or things like that. Okay, so. Um, so now, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, um, Avi, I remember, remarked on how unfair it was that the permanent, that, that, sorry, that the bosons have to work so much harder than the fermions just to calculate their own time evolution, right? And that, that, that joke kind of stuck with me. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and like it might make you wonder, you know, are bosons in some sense solving a sharp P complete problem, which, you know, we believe is even harder than an NP complete problem just to calculate their own evolution. Okay, but you have to be careful, okay? And you know, the subtlety is that, well, if you measure the, uh, a bunch of you know, photons or, or other bosons, uh, you, uh, you, you just see them in one, you know, in one particular place. 
right? You never get to actually see the amplitudes uh, directly in quantum mechanics. Okay, so you see, which means that you never actually get to see the permanent uh, of some matrix of your choice. Okay, and so so you know, nature is you know is is more subtle than just you know giving you the answer to your sharp p complete problem. What it lets you do, in some sense, is to sample a random matrix, say a random n by n complex matrix, but in a way that is biased toward those matrices that have larger permanence. Okay, and uh, so then what we did was to argue that even that task. Uh, seems to be hard for a classical computer. Uh, not sharp p hard, but one can use the sharp p hardness of the permanent to say that even if you had a fast classical sampling algorithm, uh, that would still have unlikely consequences. Okay. Uh, now, if if your classical simulation is only approximate, uh, then you know the discussion gets complicated. You have to uh, make sh uh, some some stronger conjectures, uh, just the, the, uh, than just that the polynomial hierarchy or whatever does not collapse. Uh, and uh, you know the, the the status of those stronger c conjectures uh, is still open. I would say like uh, more than a decade after we posed them. Okay, but. Uh, uh, you know, it seems like you know you you have pretty robust evidence for the hardness of these sampling problems. Okay, and I should mention that a boson sampling machine uh, would uh, uh, would not be a universal quantum computer. We don't think, or even for that matter, a universal classical computer. Right? We don't even know how to build like an AND gate or a C not gate. You know, using just the these passive linear optics. Right. If you have adaptive measurements, then it does become universal for quantum computation. That is the famous uh, Knill-Laflamme-Milburn or KLM theorem. Okay, but without that, you have a model that, in some ways, seems very, very weak, and yet it can sample these distributions. That uh, you know, uh, it seems that there's no classical polynomial time algorithm to sample. Okay, so uh, we we proposed this, and you know, we were led to this not by any. Exp you know, uh, 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 I mean, I mean, God knows by any knowledge of experimental physics, right? But mostly just because we knew that uh, uh, something about the permanent and its sharp peak completeness, and we had heard that bosons give rise to permanence and their amplitudes, and uh, so maybe maybe one can do something interesting with bosons uh, uh, because of that. Uh, but then after we uh, started talking about it. Then you know we found that the uh, uh, quantum optics uh, experimentalists, uh, you know, were really you know had been sort of looking for something to do, and they just kind of ate this up. And uh, so the uh, you know initially in like 2013 uh, they did experiments with uh, three photons, you know, verifying that yes their amplitudes look like permanence of three by three matrices. Okay, obviously that's not. Uh, in any way challenging a classical computer yet. Okay, but then they scaled up to, you know, I think five or six and then 14 photons. And um, and then in uh, 2020, uh, uh, so yeah, so, so dur during the pandemic, actually, the group of uh, uh, um, um, Chow Yang Lu at USTC in China uh, reported that they had done boson sampling with uh, uh, about 50 and then 100 uh, 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 average photons detected. Uh, actually, you know, they did a variant of it called Gaussian boson sampling. Um, and, you know, and, and, and we said, you know, this seemed very hard to simulate with a classical computer. We're going to come back to that question, okay? Because a recurring theme is that often, you know, because of all of the shortcuts that have to be made or the corners that have to be cut in order to do these experiments at all, uh, often they turn out to be much, much easier to simulate on a classical computer than you would hope. Uh, uh, and in this case, uh, you know, a, a big issue with current boson sampling experiments is that something like 70% of the photons uh, get lost on their way through. Okay, uh, uh, and you know, the more photons are lost, uh, the better classical simulations can work. Uh, now, even before that, actually, Google had beaten them to the punch uh, with a different uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, quantum supremacy demonstration. So, uh, so basically, in in 2014 or so, uh, Google hired uh, John Martinez 
who is one of the top superconducting qubits people in the world, to you know build a group uh, that was going to build like a 50 or 60 or 70 qubit uh, 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 superconducting chip, uh, which you know would go into a dilution refrigerator. That's that upside down wedding cake over there, and you know be cooled to about uh, 10 millikelvin. And you know, so that the uh, 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 qubits in it actually behave as qubits, and you know, then you have uh, uh, um, you know, uh, um, you know, fifty or sixty qubits arranged, let's say, in a rectangular lattice uh, with controllable nearest neighbor couplings. Okay, so you can do two qubit gates between the neighboring pairs, and uh, you know, and now they face the question: Well, once we build this, what should we do with it? And they looked around, and the only thing that seemed like you know you could be pretty confident that it would beat a classical computer was well something like boson sampling, okay? But uh, you know that their system was not designed for you know uh, bosonic excitations, right? It was it was based on superconducting qubits. So um, they 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 asked us sort of can you just adapt the theory to that setting? Uh, you know, to uh, let's say applying a random quantum circuit to a collection of qubits, uh, you know, that will be easier than spending a hundred million or whatever to redesign the experiment. So we said, okay, we'll do that. Uh, we're, we, you know, we are we are indeed cheaper. And uh, so uh, um, so then uh, Lee Ji Chen and I uh, had some work, you know, about, about, you know, uh, evidence for the hardness of of, uh, of simulating that in 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 2017. And then in, in 2019, uh, they reported that the, the, you know, they had actually done uh, this experiment uh, on a, uh, using a chip called Sycamore with uh, 53 qubits, actually 54, but one of them didn't work. Uh, and you know, they sampled uh, repeatedly from some probability distribution over 53-bit strings. And uh, at the time, they estimated that a uh, uh, the, you know, the best classical algorithm that they knew, uh, uh, you know, running on a supercomputer uh, would take 10,000 years to produce the same samples. Okay, and then that number got sort of endlessly repeated in the press. Uh, but, you know, one, one you know, the, the, like the fundamental problem, you could say, with quantum supremacy experiments is that you can't take any of those numbers too seriously. Okay, because you know, uh, then people will think about it more, and they'll say, "Yeah, actually, there's a better classical algorithm," and you know, the time will be whittled down, let's say, to a few weeks. Okay, and then you know, uh, if you can do something classically in a few weeks and quantumly in you know three minutes, okay, well then maybe that's still a quantum advantage, but that's less than you thought. And then you say, oh, but, but uh, actually, if I just spend more money to build uh, uh, more and more, uh, 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 you know, to, 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 to use more and more cloud resources, then I can just parallelize my classical effort. And, you know, if I spend enough money, I can do that in, uh, in two minutes. I can do that faster than the, than, the, uh, the, than the quantum computer. And now we have to say, well, okay, I guess time is not the only resource we care about. Maybe we also care about electricity costs, or you know, we care about CO2 emissions, or whatever. Uh, and you know, and by those metrics, I think uh, you know, compared to the best current classical algorithms, uh, we still have some kind of quantum advantage. But you know, maybe it's a factor of a hundred or so. Okay, it is hanging by a thin thread. So. Uh, uh, so you know, so that so that that already kind of indicates the need for for doing better experiments. Okay, and this is before we're even talking about anything useful, right? This is just establishing the reality of any quantum speed ups at all. Um, but I think the issue is is even you know, and 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 the hardware has improved, and you know, USTC has also done superconducting experiments with uh, 60 qubits. And you know the uh, the two qubit gate fidelities, which is maybe the most important number. You know those have improved uh, since since 2019, uh, and and you could do a better quantum supremacy experiment today. Uh, you know most of the the major labs seem to have moved on from this. They seem like you know they they feel like this is a done deal. Now it's just fault tolerance or bust. Uh, I want to make the case to you that this is not a done deal. Yeah. Uh, y y 
Uh, yeah, well, th- this was uh, Richard Borchards who had that that metaphor, and I, I I had a blog post to sort of you know I mean he 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 was treating that as a reductio ad absurdum basically of this entire approach. So the th- the point of my blog post was to explain why that why that why his analogy doesn't really work. Uh, so uh, basically, what I, what I said was that um, uh, the um, you know what 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 you what what you want to know is sort of that that the the difficulty you know has to do with some sort of asymptotic scaling right you want to know that there is something that is sort of increasing you know exponentially with the size of your problem right in the case of the teacups you know the issue you know seems to be merely that well okay you know number 1 there's like there's an issue of you know avogadro's number right that you have this large but constant number of particles and you know maybe a simulation would have to keep track of all of them and and uh, you know and the best computer you know to simulate the dynamics of your teacup really is just the teacup itself which you know you think of as an analog computer, and you drop it. And actually, you know, I I I, I tried it at home. You know, we, you know, with with my kids, we dropped a bunch of teacups, and uh, we we you know plotted a, a distribution of how many how many pieces. I mean, you know, it, it was it was very ambiguous what counts as a piece. You know, because they get really really tiny. But uh, we tried to count how many pieces and and see if you know we could. Uh, learn something about the distribution, but you know the other difficulty there is that you know a, a, like like a, a large part of the problem is just that you don't have sufficient knowledge of the initial state, right? It's just that you don't know the initial conditions. Okay, whereas uh, here what we're trying to put our finger on is that you know you you can know with 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 uh, with the uh, uh, for example the Google quantum supremacy experiment you can know the initial conditions perfectly. You can know the circuit perfectly, okay, and yet it would still be exponentially hard to generate the samples, okay, for a completely different reason than in the teacup case, right? Not because of you know chaos and the initial conditions, but because of the exponentiality of the of the Hilbert space, right? So uh, so that's 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 kind of the difference between the cases, um, uh, and and uh, you know it 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 is not the same as but it's related to you know the fact that these are programmable devices right you can return your qubits to the old zero state and then you know you can return that you know to applying the same circuit that you did before right you know up to you know small inaccuracies in calibration but those small inaccuracies are not the reason why it's hard to simulate right the reason why it's hard to simulate is you know is just the the enormous size of the quantum states All right. So, uh, so it, to say it in a little bit more detail, uh, the random circuit proposal is basically that you know you, uh, the classical skeptic, uh, challenge a quantum computer uh, by sending it a randomly generated quantum circuit, uh, call it C, on some number of qubits n, and then you demand that the quantum computer uh, send back to you quickly. Uh, a, a, a list of samples, call them S1 up to SK, uh, which in the ideal case uh, would be drawn independently from a probability distribution that I'll call D sub C, okay, which is just whatever distribution you get by uh, starting with all qubits in the zero state, applying C, you know, and then measuring each, each of the qubits in the zero one basis. Okay, so uh, uh, you know, you, you, like, like there, there, there's this sort of tricky conceptual distinction here, right? Which is that uh, you know the problem is not simulate this device or simulate you know the 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 uh, you know the, the the physics of this particular device. If that was the problem, then by definition, the device could never get it wrong, right? Just like when you drop the teacup, right? It never fails to simulate that teacup. Right, but instead we are giving a mathematical specification of what we want, okay, such that you could easily imagine that the quantum device would fail to solve the problem. Right, the fact that the quantum device, you know, correctly solves this is itself something that has to be experimentally checked. Okay, so uh, so so you get k samples, you know. So imagine that n is 53 here. You know, imagine that k is a few million. Let's say, 
Okay. The nice thing about superconducting qubits is that they're very fast, and you can get each sample in a, in something like you know 40 microseconds. Okay. So in a few minutes, you can get millions of samples. Um, uh, now, uh, what does the random circuit look like? Uh, well, basically, you know, it has these two qubit gates, which are staggered in such a way that every qubit can influence every other one, right? So we want, you know, scrambling to happen, which means, you know, we need horizontally and vertically adjacent qubits. Uh, um, uh, you know, we need them in a in a in a pattern where information is getting across. Uh, and uh, in Google's experiment, the depth of the circuit was 20. Okay, so you know there's sort of, you know, uh, 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 enough time for every qubit to send a message to every other. Although you know, not with a whole lot of room to spare. Uh, and now we face the the really crucial question, which is once you you've measured and you've gotten these outputs, how do you verify that the quantum computer did anything interesting? So uh, uh, um, the, what, what Google did was, you know, one of the simplest things that you could imagine, uh, which uh, they called the linear cross entropy benchmark, or LXEB. Okay, even though it's not really about entropy at all, <laughs> I don't know why they called it that. Okay, so uh, uh, but here here's what it is. Okay, so you uh, uh, using uh, your knowledge of the circuit C. And using a classical computer, where, you know, which is assumed to you know, be able to do two to the n classical computation, and we'll, you know, we'll come back to that point, okay, you calculate uh, what would have been the probability for an ideal quantum computer to have outputted each of the samples that you saw. Okay? That's these uh, 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 squared matrix elements there. Okay? And you do that for each of the S sub i's that was observed. Okay, and then you know that gives you the the sort of predicted probability for each of the outputs that you observed, and then you add all those numbers up. Okay, and and then you you uh, consider the quantum computer to have passed the test if and only if that sum exceeds a certain threshold. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, if we imagine that you just pick the S sub i's uniformly at random. Just you know, with you know, not needing a quantum computer at all, then we would expect that you know, since these probabilities have to add up to one, and there's two to the n of them, you know, uh, on average they're going to be two to the minus n, right? And if so, if I add up k of them, then I would get k over two to the n. That would be my expected value for this sum. Okay, but if I'm if the quantum computer is really working properly, then the sum ought to be larger than that. Okay, why? Because, well, you know, uh, uh, the outcomes with the higher probabilities should be occurring more frequently, right? That's what it means to be, you know, doing sampling in the correct way. Uh, so how much larger should it be? Well, uh, if you do the calculation, you find, so, so the, the amplitudes can be approximated as just uh, 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 independent complex Gaussians with, with means of zero. Uh, which means that the probabilities can be approximated as exponentially distributed random variables. Uh, so, like, you know, on average they're 2 to the minus n, but they have little wiggles in them. Some of them are 2 over 2 to the n, or 3 over 2 to the n, or a half over 2 to the n. Okay, they're, you know, exponentially distributed. And if the quantum computer is working right, you should be uh, preferentially seeing the, the heavier ones. And uh, uh, you know, and, and and so, what should be the the expected value of this sum? Well, it's an integral, which you know, even I, as a computer scientist, remembered how to do. And the answer you get is two over two to the n, so precisely twice the classical value. Okay, and so now you have a situation that's very closely analogous uh, to the Bell inequality. Okay, for those who have seen that. It's like you have some number where you know you believe that any classical theory could achieve at most a certain number, and an ideal quantum device would achieve some larger number, right? And the goal with your experiment, well, your you know your device is not ideal, so you're not going to achieve that larger number. In this case, two, you know, a b equals two in that expression there. Your goal is just to get any value of b that is larger than one. 
right, that beats the what 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 you expect is the classical bound. And what Li Ji Chen and I did was precisely to give some complexity theoretic reduction, you know, admittedly based on a non-standard assumption uh, that said that you know it is unlikely that a classical that a that an efficient classical algorithm could generate samples with a B value grade, uh, that is that is anything bounded above one. Okay, so what did Google report in its 2019 experiment? Well, they reported, you know, drum roll, that they achieved a value of B uh, that is 1.002. Okay, uh, but the, the good news was that, you know, this was like separated from one by uh, like, you know, you know, 20, you know, sigmas of, of, you know, standard deviation or something. So, you know, the, you know, while it was only a tiny bit more than one, it definitely was more than one. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is the simplest test that I could think of also. Uh, uh, well, we had we had this uh, in in the paper with Liji. We used something else called a heavy output generation hog. Uh, but uh, you know, I, you know that one like it involved this like two thresholds, whereas here you only need one threshold. And so you know, actually, once I saw this test, I was like, yeah, this seems simpler. And actually, I, I had a uh, an analysis of uh, you know. Uh, like, you know, how to generate certified random bits from quantum supremacy experiments. That was just uh, in uh, stock a month ago. And, and like for that application, for example, like you really, you know, this test is really the thing that you want, All right? It's, uh, you know, it, it, it leads to the, the uh, by far the simplest analysis. So that, 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 that's one thing that made me warm on this test. But I don't know, I mean, you know, if you want to suggest a different test, you know, I don't think the actual choice of test matters all that much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you know because they they realize that like you don't actually have to calculate entropy. Like that's not you know you just want kind of the simplest thing that's going to differentiate the quantum sampling from classical sampling, and that's just calculate all the probabilities and add them all up. So um, yeah, I mean I mean yeah, we're we're gonna see like what. What, what are the drawbacks of this whole paradigm? But I think, that, to, to be honest, that the drawbacks would apply equally to this linear cross entropy or to just about any other similar test that you could come up with. Uh, if, if there's a counterexample, then I'd love to hear about that offline. Okay, so that brings me to, uh, well, what is wrong with the current experiments? Okay, so, you know, uh, of course, you know, we don't, you know, the, these qubits are just the bare physical qubits. They are not error corrected at all. And because they're not error corrected, you know, we are extremely limited in what can be done. In Google's experiment, each two qubit gate had a fidelity of about 99.5%. Okay, and that's, you know, that's amazing compared to what was achievable 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, but it still means that if you apply a thousand two qubit gates in sequence, well, your total gate fidelity, your total circuit fidelity is going to go like 0.995 to the 1000 power or something like that, right? So, so your signal uh, gets ex sort of exponentially attenuated as you, as you scale the system up. Uh, now, you know, and, and this is the reason why they only got an LXEB score of 1.002, right? It's just because, you know, now, now maybe scientifically, the most important thing that we learned from the Google experiment was that the circuit fidelity seems to only decrease in that way and not in any worse way. Okay, so Gil Kalai, who some of you might have seen as a you know prominent skeptic of quantum computing, you know he went on the record with a firm prediction that uh, um, you know there are going to be some sort of conspiratorial correlations between all the gates, and and you know it, you know the, the 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 errors will not be anything like independent. Okay, that prediction was tested, and in these experiments, uh, it was wrong. Okay. And so, you know, Gil now in his latest papers is saying, you know, um, basically, you know, this is impossible. And he doesn't quite say, you know, that, that the experiment was fraudulent, but he sort of leaves that as the only possible conclusion. 
So, uh, but you know, now USTC has also done this kind of experiment. So, you know, uh, uh, I think you know that that you know that position might become increasingly difficult for him. Um, but uh, in any case, you know, uh, uh, you know, when you know, with the errors falling off in that way, I mean, that's sort of good news because it means that if you could increase your two qubit fidelity to something like 99.99 percent, then quantum error correction ought to work. You know, for the you know, we have we know of you know the surface code or other fault tolerance codes that that seem like they they then ought to work. Um, but uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, f uh, before we can get to fault tolerance, it means that there's sort of no hope of scaling these experiments up to hundreds of qubits or you know thousands of gates because the signal uh, will just be too tiny to detect. Like uh, the distribution that we're sampling from, basically, will get you know exponentially closer and closer to the uniform distribution. Okay, and then you know the the deviations from uniformity will get tinier and tinier, and you know we'll need exponentially many samples in order to even notice those deviations. You know, and then uh, uh, there goes uh, any hope of a quantum speed up. Okay, but uh, uh, you know the even more immediate problem is that you know they are uh, taking advantage of the fact that the gates are spat spatially local you know, in, in superconducting qubits, uh, or in the case of boson sampling, that many of the photons are lost. Okay, so taking advantage of the imperfections of the existing experiments turns out to allow uh, classical simulations of these experiments, uh, spoofing attacks that are much more efficient than we would like. Okay, so uh, some of the, the main attacks, uh, Pan, Chen, and Zhang have shown how to do tensor network contractions where, you know, as, as I said, it just, you know, if you want to do it on a classical computer faster than the Google experiment, it just comes down to a question of money and electricity uh, at, at the end of the day. Uh, and um, and, the, and there's, a, there's another uh, classical algorithm by uh, Gal et al., uh, which is uh, actually polynomial time, so it just runs on a laptop, uh, and it achieves a linear cross-entropy score uh, with Google's parameters that's like 1.0002, okay? So it gets about one-tenth of the excess that Google got in its experiment. So, you know, you can see the experiment is still winning, but only by one order of magnitude, right? If they improve their algorithm, uh, then, then, you know, the quantum advantage could just go away entirely. Um, okay, but, but none of this even gets to what I see as the most fundamental issue, which is that uh, uh, you know, in order to verify the results of these experiments at all, we had to calculate this linear cross entropy number with our classical computer, and that took two to the n time, right? Classic, or, or you know, you could say uh, 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 the the time that is needed for verification is directly tied to the time that a classical person would need to spoof the results. Right, they both involve sort of calculating the you know the same basic numbers, right? And so what that means is that there is no hope of scaling these experiments to just completely beyond the range where any classical computer could hope to compete, like where it really would take you know billions of years or whatever. Because if we went to that range, then we couldn't even verify that the experiments were were doing what they were supposed to do, right? So. Um, you know, now, now Shor's algorithm doesn't have this problem, right? Uh, you know, uh, because the factoring problem is in the complexity class NP, right? If you, you know, it might be very hard to find the factors, but once you found them, they're easy to, to, uh, uh, to multiply and actually also easy to check that they're prime. Uh, but, you know, with these experiments, the difficulty of classical spoofing seems directly tied to the difficulty of classical verification. And that is what I want to get around while remaining you know, in, in the realm of things that we can implement on current quantum computers. Okay? So this one slide here kind of summarizes how I think about the present situation in quantum algorithms. Okay, there are basically three goals, three things that we want our quantum speed up to achieve. 
The first is that it should be NISCI, okay? That's not a technical term, but it should be implementable on current devices or current or near future devices, okay? And uh, uh, roughly speaking, anything that involves doing, you know, uh, uh, arithmetic on superpositions over integers that are encoded in binary, as in Shor's algorithm, or as in all sorts of recent cryptographic protocols, is not NISCI, okay? That, you know, we have no hope of doing any of that with current devices, okay? Something that looks more like a random circuit, or maybe like some physics simulations, that, that has a chance of being NISCI. Uh, the second thing we want is, of course, at least in principle, there should be a quantum advantage compared to the best-known classical algorithm. Okay, uh, both, you know, uh, uh, concretely, you know, in terms of like actual numbers, uh, you know, with the with our device compared to the best classical computers, but also asymptotically, right? We want to see that as we scaled to more and more uh, qubits that, you know, that you know, ideally we're beating the best classical algorithm by, uh, by uh, an exponentially scaling amount, right? We don't want to be in the teacup situation. Okay. Um, and then the third requirement, as I said, is that uh, we ought to be able to efficiently verify uh, the uh, outputs of the experiment using our classical computer, okay? Uh, without having to take uh, classical exponential time. Uh, a, a, as with random circuit sampling. Okay, and I would say that the current situation is that we know how to ach achieve any two of these three goals. Okay, so uh, if you want something that's NISCI and that's efficiently verifiable, I mean, the whole field of quantum machine learning, right, and like these optimization methods like QAOA and uh, VQE, right, these are all giving you candidates for that. Okay, the, the trouble is, despite thousands of papers that have been written now about these kinds of uh, heuristic optimization algorithms, we still have no clear case that any of them are beating a classical computer in a fair comparison, okay, for any, for any optimization or machine learning problem, right? And, you know, like, you know, until that question is addressed head on, it doesn't matter how many more papers are written about these algorithms, right? Uh, Okay, if you want in principle quantum advantage and uh, efficiently verifiable, I mean, that goes back to the beginning of the field. Shor's algorithm is a candidate for that. But there's also a whole bunch of recent uh, uh, cryptographic protocols for, you know, verifying, uh, uh, you know, for proving what a quantum computer is doing to a classical skeptic. Some of you might know that Ermola Mahadev uh, had a big breakthrough in that subject uh, five years ago. And there's a bunch of related works by uh, Norm Yao, uh, Greg Kahanumoku Meyer, uh, Umesh Vazirani, uh, and, and, and many others, uh, which have shown you know, like you, you don't necessarily have to do the modular exponentiation function on a superposition of inputs. It would be enough to do x squared mod n, you know, on a f of x equals x squared mod n on a superposition of x's. And then uh, you can use that in a cryptographic protocol to prove quantum advantage, uh, which has, you know, you know they, they, they have this beautiful argument that I, 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 I loved at first sight, where he, here's what they say. They say, look, either, you know, you can't break, you know, this crypto system of like squaring modulo a composite number, either, you know, uh, th that crypto system is secure and you can't break it, and in that case, their protocol is sound, and, you know, it, you, you prove quantum advantage to the classical skeptic, or else the crypto system is broken. And in that case, you've proven quantum advantage in a completely different way, <laughs> right? By, uh, uh, you know, doing, you know, you, know you're, you presumably did something like Shor's algorithm. Okay, so, um, okay, and then if you want something that's both NISCI and that gets an in-principle quantum advantage, uh, but that's not uh, uh, efficiently verifiable, then that's exactly the current generation of sampling-based quantum supremacy experiments, such as random circuit sampling and boson sampling. Okay, so the challenge, obviously, is to get to the center of this Venn diagram, either by starting with these heuristic optimization methods and getting you know, a clear quantum advantage out of them, 
or by starting with these, you know, cryptographic protocols or things based on lattices and number theory and figuring out how to implement one of them on a NISC device, which, you know, good luck with that. Uh, or, uh, you know, and this is the direction that I've personally thought about the most, uh, starting with uh, the kinds of quantum supremacy experiments that we know how to do and then figuring out a way to make their outputs efficiently checkable with a classical computer. Okay, so how might we achieve that third uh, uh, arrow? So, so I want to give you, so, so, so I don't have an answer. If I had the answer, then that's what the talk would be about. Okay, but I'm at least going to give you a pretty clear open question that I think directly bears on, on, on this. Okay, so here's my open question. Um, so given a quantum circuit C, uh, let me define C to be peaked uh, if it has the property that when you run C on the all zero initial state and then you measure the output in the standard basis, there is some particular basis state, call it X, that occurs with a really large probability. Right? By really large, Let's say we mean at least a tenth, okay? Um, now, we could generalize this definition to, to you know, uh, 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 the output state of C having sort of any properties at all that we can feasibly detect, you know, by measuring that state. You know, like better than just by running C inverse and, you know, seeing that we get back to the all zero state. I mean, you know, more efficiently than that. I want it to have some, uh, property, you know, uh, uh, you know, it could be uh, in the Hadamard basis. It could be, you know, uh, um, um, biased and in, in some in some way that is easy for us to detect. Hey, that's 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 what I want. Okay, and now I'm going to imagine the following thought experiment. Okay, we're going to pick a random quantum circuit you know, just like in the uh, quantum supremacy experiments uh, with, let's say, n qubits and some number, you know, m of gates. Let's say m is n squared or it's some other polynomial in n. Okay, but now we're going to throw out the circuit unless it is peaked. Okay, we're going to condition on the event that our, that our random circuit is peaked. Okay, so now we have a random peaked circuit. And now uh, my question is, what can we say about these random peaked circuits? What do they look like? Okay, and, and you know, let me give you two extreme possibilities, uh, neither of which uh, I, I know how to prove is impossible. Okay, the first uh, extreme possibility would be that a random peaked circuit just looks like a whole bunch of random gates followed by the inverses of those gates. Right, so you know, if I have u and then u inverse, well, of course that is peaked because it just computes the identity, right? Which means that the all zero string will have uh, probability one of being output. So, uh, you know, or more generally, uh, this the random peaked circuit could be such that you know, when I do a whole bunch of cancellations, you know, uh, with my classical computer, I reduce the circuit to almost to to something trivial. Right, and like I easily see with my classical computer that you know this this is a sort of tri a trivial circuit, you know, the, not hard to simulate. Okay, now the uh, 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 other extreme possibility would be that a random peaked circuit is indistinguishable by any efficient classical algorithm from just a ra a a fully random quantum circuit. Right, they look identical to any classical test that I can apply. Uh, and nevertheless, you know, I can take the peaked circuit, put it on my quantum computer, and then I'll see the difference, right? I'll see that, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 there, there's some output that it's uh, producing at least a tenth of the time. Okay, so in this second case, I think that, you know, like what we would have established would be that the kinds of quantum circuits that we want for verifiable NISC quantum supremacy at least exist, okay? We still would not have answered the question of how to find those circuits efficiently, right? We would still have that problem, but at least the circuits would platonically be out there. 
okay? Uh, uh, you know, circuits that sort of look random, look like the things that we can run on current devices, uh, but secretly, the, you know, or obfuscatedly, they are concentrating the amplitude on some particular output that we can recognize at the end. Okay, and one can ask a whole bunch of related questions. So uh, here's one of my favorites. Uh, given an n qubit m gate uh, random quantum circuit, uh, let's say that you get to add more gates onto the end of that circuit, okay, in order to get an overall circuit that is peaked. Okay, then how many more gates must you add? Okay, so I claim, you know, uh, a, a, a clear upper bound here is m. Right, you know, you, you if you if you can add m more gates, then you just add you know the inverse of of the random circuit, and then of course you have something peaked. Okay, but can you do it with substantially fewer than m additional gates? Even let's say what with m over two additional gates. Uh, now, using uh, recent results about random quantum circuits, you know, uh, giving you T designs, uh, it is possible to prove that uh, 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 the number of gates you have to add is at least like m to the one fifth power or something like that. Okay, but that's you know that leaves an enormous room between the upper bound and the lower bound. Um, one could also ask, you know, what fraction of quantum circuits are peaked? Again, I have upper and lower bounds, which are pretty easy, and but which are far from matching each other. Um, and then, of course, how hard is it to sample a random peaked circuit? Or what about a peaked circuit that is hard to distinguish from random, Okay, that looks random? So uh, I did work with a, uh, um, a recently graduated student at UT uh, named Yushuan Zhang. And uh, we have at least some, some preliminary empirical data. Okay, uh, albeit not a theorem. Uh, so what we did is we generated random quantum circuits uh, with different numbers of qubits, you know, 8, 10, 12, and so forth. That's the uh, uh, x-axis. And then we looked at, uh, 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 we, we fixed some number of gates, you know, let's say, you know, the random circuit has maybe 100 gates. And then we try to add either like, uh, uh, 50 or 33 or 25 gates onto the end of that circuit to get an overall circuit that is as peaked as possible. Okay, and we just use uh, 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 local search. You know, we use like a, a heuristic optimization to try to search for the circuit that is peaked. And so what we found is that you know actually much more peaked circuits than I would have guessed uh, exist. Okay, so we find, for example, when there are 12 qubits, you know, you can take 100 random gates and you can add 50 more gates onto the end of it and, you know, and you get, uh, um, you know, like some, some output that's occurring with probability a quarter. Okay, how is that happening? I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, if, the, if our 100 gate circuit, you know, if it had instead generated a har random state, then it is easy to check that this would not have been possible. Okay, which means that whatever the last 50 gates are doing, they are exploiting some sort of structure in the output of our 100 gate circuit that is not shared by a har random state. Okay? But what is that structure? We have no idea. We've examined the circuits, you know, they look random to us. We don't see any pattern, and yet clearly there is something, right? They, you know, they end up okay, that's the good news. For, for verifiable NISC supremacy. The bad news is that the amount of peakness that we're able to find seems to be decreasing exponentially with the number of qubits. Okay? So it might be that there's a surprising thing here, you know, maybe even usable at the level of 50 qubits or 60 qubits, but it's at least from the, exper from the numerical data, it's not looking like it would scale to hundreds of qubits. But, you know, again, we don't know. Or maybe our solver is just not working well enough. Um, so what if the, uh, the suitable peak circuits just don't exist? Or they do exist, but they can't be found efficiently? Uh, you know, I heard just a month ago, I heard a really cute idea for another type of quantum supremacy experiment that we can do, which is that we could just take the standard random circuit sampling experiments and run over and over 
you know, until we start seeing collisions, right? Which that should not take two to the end time because of the birthday paradox. Uh, you know, there were 23 people in a room is enough to make two have the same birthday. Likewise, we should only need to order two to the n over two samples until we start seeing collisions. And with those collisions, we could start doing statistics that you know can differentiate or the distribution that we're sampling from from the uniform distribution. Uh, so you know we've uh, with Andrea Mari we uh, ran some numbers, and it looks like you might be able to do this by taking the current superconducting devices and just running them for like a few months. <laughs> that that you know maybe that's worth doing. I don't know. So let me conclude. Um, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, in some sense, the real question I'm trying to ask here goes all the way back to the beginning of quantum computing theory. Okay, we're asking sort of how generic are quantum speedups. You know, you know that, you know, Shor's algorithm can give you a speed up for this very special problem. You know that a random circuit can give you a speed up in some sense, but it's, you know, it might take you exponential time just to verify that you achieved the speed up. Right, so can you get the best of both worlds? Can you have a circuit that looks basically random and it nevertheless, you know, choreographs a pattern of interference, you know, in a way to achieve a huge and verifiable speed up over any classical algorithm? Or is there some law of conservation of weirdness that says that like any qu quantum speed up, if you want it to be exponential, you know, it has to be for some really weird task uh, with some really weird circuit and there's no free lunch. So, you know, we now urgently need to know just how non-weird can we make it. All right, so thanks. Thanks very much, Scott. So we have time for a few questions. Comments? Yeah, uh, please. Oh, yes. Why? Well, because, because I can't rule out the possibility that there might be interesting physics simulations, uh, which in this case might be verifiable, uh, not because the problems are in NP, which is you know, the computer science reason, but rather for the physics reason that we could take the output of our quantum computer and compare it to experimental reality. Like you know, for estimating the rate of a chemical reaction, we can compare that to the you know data from the lab. What is the rate of that chemical reaction, right? And, and we could validate the results of our physical simulation in that sort of way. You know, that's the, that's the hope anyway. You know, the, the, the big question is whether you can do that with a NISC device and in a way that actually beats the best that you can do with a classical computer. Some of you might know that IBM tried to do that recently, but it turned out not to be beatable by classical, I mean, I mean, it turned out rather to be, not to be unbeatable, <laughs> to be beatable. Bye. Good, anything, anything else? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to follow up on the random circuit sampling. Sure. And I wonder when you and your student were doing these experiments, do you do the Clifford plus T random circuit sim sampling or some very special class of quantum circuits? Um, let's see. I, uh, I'm trying to remember which basis of gates we used. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean my, my, my guess would be that it doesn't matter very much. Uh, but, you know, it's possible that it would matter. I think that... Uh, I think it was like C knots and random one qubit gates, but I, I could check that and get back to you. Right. The reason I'm wondering this is so, uh, in some cases, a restricted set of Clifford plus T circuits is also very interesting. For example, uh, the Toffley Hadmar circuits, because they correspond to some very nice uh, group, th uh, group structure that we could leverage. So I wonder is it possible, in order for us to understand about this? problem of a uh, peak circuit, is it possible to look at it from a number of theoretic perspective and say, well, I want to get this uh, group element like from, let's say, uh, the orthogonal matrix over dyadic fractions, then how far am I from uh, this current matrix to this one specific matrix? So I cannot rule out the possibility that the gate set might matter for that random peak circuits problem. Uh, you know, like, like the Soloveig-Kataev theorem, right, doesn't 
doesn't tell you that it's irrelevant because it blows up the size of the circuit. Uh, my intuition would be that probably like like the gate set matters if you care about which unitaries can be exactly generated or so forth. And if you just care about these approximate questions, like you know, is it, you know, do you have some uh, uh, out some basis state that's output with at least a tenth probability, then you know, you know, the the my my guess is that the the uh, the answer should just be you know universal. It shouldn't it shouldn't really depend on the set of gates. But you know, I I, I don't have a proof of that. I could be wrong. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, 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 it, it wouldn't mean that you have to calculate the probabilities, not necessarily, right? Like, like you know, s someone might equally argue, well, with Shor's algorithm, in order to generate a circuit that ge you know that outputs the factors of this number, don't you have to already know the factors? Okay, well, you know, no, you don't, because Shor explained why not, right? Uh, uh, you know, and like it, it might be that there is some way of generating a ra a circuit that looks random knowing that the circuit is peaked, you know, maybe even knowing what is the special output, okay, uh, but with some additional secret information that would, you know, come out of the, the, the generation process, uh, but, but it would not imply some general ability to calculate any of the output probabilities. You know, I don't know if that's possible or not. The, the, that's precisely my question. It's just a question of sampling what, okay? The, the, for boson sampling, you're given the beam splitter network, and now you have to calculate the output probabilities, okay? In this case, we get to pick the circuit. That's the key difference. Okay. Um, I should mention that on Thursday, I'll have a technical talk, apparently, with, with uh, yet, yet another approach to near-term quantum supremacy, which uh, uses the time-honored trick of completely changing the question. Okay, one last question, maybe, yeah. Uh, maybe I mean I mean I mean the, you you could say you know th th this is this is not a you know it, you know necessarily a hard computational complexity question right this is a question that might be answerable you know using tools from information theory or analysis of entropy or things like that uh, I don't know that's that's for that that's for any of you to try to solve while I go and deal with the robot apocalypse. Okay, and on that note, I think why don't we uh, thank Scott and have a nice talk.